Now it's time to talk about Homo erectus, the first species that just, well, kind of looks like us. Now we're going to start talking about late genus Homo, so everything that comes after all of those early Homo species. Everything that we're going to be talking about now is firmly within the genus Homo, and nobody's really disputing that fact. Um, so we have a couple different species we're going to talk about. First, we're going to talk about Homo erectus. Then we'll talk about a couple different species that might have been running around in the middle Pleistocene. Then we'll talk about some small-bodied species, Homo floresiensis and Homo naledi, which kind of confuse some of what we think is going on. Um, and lastly, we'll close out talking with the Neanderthals. Um, but let's remind ourselves what's going on with genus Homo here in the first place. So when we put something in the genus Homo, in general, it has a slightly larger brain um, as compared to Australopithecus. It has smaller teeth as compared to Australopithecus. We generally see them use tools. This may not be unique, but this is definitely a requirement for being in the genus Homo. And we also see more advanced bipedality. Um, let's also remind ourselves what's going on with our early Homo species. Um, and you know, some people like to debate whether these belong in Homo or not. Um, these all happen in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, in you know, close to open woodland grass, uh, sorry, closed woodland or open grassland environments, kind of halfway in the middle there. Um, brains are at least 600 cubic centimeters, um, and we primarily see use of the old one tool culture. Um, and we, of course, also see this diverse morphology, so there's a couple different things going on at the beginning of our genus Homo. But let's talk about a very important species here, Homo erectus. So going back to our tree, now we are right here. So Homo erectus actually was around for a really long period of time. And that's actually kind of cool. Like they were successful. What they were doing worked. So they survived for a long period of time. Um, they were discovered in the 1800s um, by Eugene Dubois. A, uh, he was a French a uh, French researcher here, um, and he discovered uh, some femora and a skull cap um, in a river in Java. Um, he originally named it Pithecanthropus erectus. Um, this specimen is also known as Java man. Um, you can see that femur there. He had a bone cancer. That that growth there, that's really painful. Um, the femur were later discovered to be modern humans, and they were... Um, uh, deposited much more recently, but this skull cap does appear to be something different. Um, so you can see here's an early reconstruction of Homo erectus. Um, so even though it was named to a different genus, it was later put back into Homo since it is very closely related to us. Uh, but let's look at some of the different features we find on our Homo erectus friends here. We have this long, low cranium. You can see um, that head in profile. The brain case kind of looks like a football. Um, we also see a subnasal prognathism. So the mouth protrudes below the nose, but the nose itself doesn't really protrude from our cranium here. We also see very thick cranial bones, like they have hard heads and it would be much harder to give them a concussion. Um, we also see some cranial superstructures. Um, so we see a bar-like supraorbital torus or, or this brow ridge, it's a, like a thick bar. Um, we also see a sagittal keel. Here, think more like faux hawk as opposed to mohawk. So there's a slight thickening, but it's not that sagittal keel we're seeing in Paranthropus. Um, and then we see an occipital torus or a little bit of a ridge right here at the back. As you can see, there, there are these differences we can point out when we're um, distinguishing them from modern humans, but Overall, like, that cranium looks pretty human to me um, if you're comparing it, say, to a chimpanzee. This definitely looks much closer to a modern human than a chimp, at least to my eyes. Um, but let's talk about more than just the head here. So if we can look at body weight estimates for all these different species, you can see all of our Australopithecus are relatively small. And Homo habilis is about the same size as Australopithecus. No big increase there. But here with Homo erectus, we are seeing our first big jump in body size. Of course, modern humans are still larger than Homo erectus, but we are seeing this shift into a larger body here. 
And now we are finally finding species with proportions similar to modern humans. So you can see our Australopithecus afarensis still looks pretty much like a chimp. It has that, you know, really uh, kind of A-line, rib cage, long arm, short legs. And our Homo erectus, now we have long legs, shorter arms. Our hands have much shorter phalanges or finger bones. Looks a lot more like a modern human here. Um, and its rib cage doesn't have that uh, extreme A-line anymore. So now we kind of have a much narrower chest. Um, and you can see the head is just a little bit smaller. So looks a little bit more balanced here. We're also seeing um, very clear arches in the feet. So more um, strong evidence of advanced bipedality. And what's one of the cool things about Homo erectus is we find him everywhere. So here is Homo erectus in Indonesia. We find him there at about 1.8 million years ago. Um, possibly as late as 50,000 years ago. So that's on a, a really long period of time. Um, this younger date is a little bit debated, so I'm not quite sure how true that one is, but Homo erectus was certainly around for a long time. We also find Homo erectus in China. So here's some specimens from Zhou Kodian, um, as early as 1.6 million years ago to 300,000 years ago. So that's relatively recent. Again, a long period of time. Um, this particular specimen is known as Peking Man. Um, I believe this is one of the specimens that was unfortunately lost um, during World War II. So unfortunately, um, sometimes we have scientific casualties to wars more than just human ones. Um, of course, Homo erectus was also in Africa. So here's some specimens from Kubi 4 and Lake Turkana at 1.8 million years ago. Of course, a little bit earlier because um, all humans originally came from Africa anyway. Um, and here is one of the more famous uh, specimens of Homo erectus. This is the Nario Kotome boy. Um, this one is particularly helpful because you can see we just have a lot of the skeleton here. So we're able to say a little bit more about this, this specimen in particular. This one's a little bit younger than the earliest one. So he's only about 1.6 million years ago. But because we have most of a skeleton, we can actually estimate um, his height here. Um, of course, we don't have all of it, and people will create slightly different estimates because, you know, like, um, how much do we think the feet added? How much do we think the space is in between all of the joints? Um, so some people thought he was pretty tall, but also um, more um, recent estimates are a little bit more conservative and we think um, in the height for um, this particular specimen. We also have these beautiful footprints from Illaret at about 1.5 million years ago. And this is especially cool because we can compare the Illaret footprints to the Laetoli footprints. So we can compare how we think Australopithecus afarensis walked to Homo erectus. And we are seeing much more advanced uh, bipedality going on. These are much more human-like. And essentially, we do think they were walking pretty much exactly like us at this point in time. Um, but let's look at a few more um, specimens here. Here's one from Dhaka in Ethiopia. Look at that brow ridge and just how thick those bones are. Like this is a strong head. One of the interesting things is we are finding insane amounts of variation within Homo erectus. So here are two individuals from the same place. <laughs> We're seeing brain sizes range from 640 to 1200 cubic centimeters. Like that's a lot of variation in the same species. Um, we also find some curious individuals from Demonisi, from the Republic of Georgia. Remember, Georgia the country, very different than Georgia the state. Don't, don't confuse them. Uh, these guys are relatively early at 1.7 million years ago. And what's interesting is we actually find a relative um, diversity in morphology here. So you can see here's some individuals. Um, but this is one of my favorite pictures because we can see some of these different skulls right next to each other uh, and see that there's a little bit of variation in the morphology of the brow ridge, how big it is. We even see this one guy here who's missing all of his teeth. So this is a very old individual who because he's missing all of his teeth, uh, people are probably helping him survive. So that gives us a little bit of insight into their culture. Um, we can also see a slightly different morphology with the shape of the teeth in some of these guys. Um, and of course, we cannot forget some of the facial reconstructions. Um, these are, of course, all artistic licenses, but I, I do enjoy them. They bring me great, 
great happiness. Um, but what we're seeing here with Homo erectus is they were everywhere. Um, Homo erectus were all throughout Africa. They were in the Middle East. They were in India. They were in China. And they were in Indonesia as well. Um, and this is just a pretty wide range in time, but also a really big geographic range. And this has led some people to ask the question, how should we classify this variation? Are these African and Asian populations the same species? What should we do with the weird individuals at Demonisi? Um, so a couple of different people have a few different answers, but generally they fall into two camps. We have the lumpers versus the splitters. Um, lumpers tend to see fewer species because they are more willing to group lots of variation within one species. And they just say, okay, all of this, it's just Homo erectus. It's one um, species that varies a lot. Um, and we would use Homo erectus sensu lato. Why am I adding this weird thing to the end? Well, that's because if you talk to a splitter, they're like, no, 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 no. The Asian populations and the African populations are different. Um, so they would only call the Asian um, ones Homo erectus, and then we have a different name for the African ones, Homo ergaster, and they would include Demonisi and Homo ergaster. Um, the reason why we have the same Homo erectus happening in two places here is because that very first specimen that was discovered in Indonesia, that's where the name Homo erectus goes with. So that's um, why we use these um, denominators here, sensu lato versus sensu stricto, to help determine which definition you're using. Um, it just happens to do with the weirdness of how we name things. Um, we always want the name to go with that original specimen as a way to honor the person who discovered it. Um, but let's, let's look at a map here. Um, so at about 1.8 million years ago, we see these guys, or Homo ergaster or Homo erectus, um, appearing in Africa. Um, and then at 1.7 million years ago, they are already in Demonisi and in Indonesia. Like, they went there immediately. <laughs> um, and then a little bit later, we find them a little bit uh, farther north in China at Zhou Kodian. So Homo erectus or Homo ergaster, whoever you want to call them, like, they left Africa pretty quickly and went many different places. Um, what is happening at this point in time? We're talking about the Pleistocene boundary, so the boundary between two different geological time periods. Um, and this is at about 1.8 million years ago, and there is a cooling and drying going on throughout the Earth. So now we're seeing this increase in grasslands and increase in herd animals. So with all of this ecological change, we are now creating a feedback loop. So this ecological change causes a dietary change in our hominins. Homo erectus has this difference in environment, so they, of course, need to change to match that. This causes an increased body and brain size um, because there's now more large herd animals, and that also increases their range and dispersal, and their increased brain and body size um, also feeds into an increased range in dispersal. So this is why we think we see so many cha big changes happening all at once with Homo erectus. And of course, it's also helpful to check in with how we think everybody's related to each other. Um, so somehow Homo erectus is descended from an early Homo species. Of course, people like to debate exactly which one. The Asian populations of Homo erectus are descended from the African populations, and the African populations of Homo erectus give rise to later Homo species, including ourselves. So can you explain? Where and when did Homo erectus live, and how are they different from previous hominins? <music>